may I now invite Dayanita, please. Dayanita is doing a large project for uh, Venice and she, there was a chance that she couldn't make it because there was some serious problem which cropped up the last moment she was there, but she made it just yesterday she came and she's rushed and I'm really, really thankful to her that she is you know, made to Chandigarh to give this presentation. Thank you, Divan. I have great admiration for what you do here at Lalit Kala. So I had to be here, but thank you for inviting me. And I'm very happy to be in Chandigarh, having studied in the hills just above you. So it's all very nostalgic and all kinds of, I wanted to go to 18th sector market and thinking there'll be a little Chinese restaurant. I had no idea what had happened in Chandigarh in these last years. But I'm especially delighted to be speaking here because I've never had so many of my colleagues in the front row in the audience. So I'm, I'm very grateful that there's so many of them here listening and not at the Rose Garden where I would rather be. Tomorrow at 11.30, I think there's Mr. and Mrs. Rose competition. <laughs> I would say not to be missed. Um, I could start by saying that the book is really the form of my, is, 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 the, is my form. It's, it's the heart of my work. And I think I was literally born into it. It took me many years to realize it. But I'm going to show you an album that my mother made while she was uh, pregnant with me, I suppose you would say. Uh, girlfriends till he married Noni, hope so. All these photos had been carelessly thrown in a box. Hey, some respect for photography at least, 1960. So that's my mother making an album of all my father's girlfriends. <laughs> my father was a I believe a great Casanova. <laughs> and then my mother had put herself on the last page. Before I was born, my mother had made, um, had made this book and my childhood uh, was just always lots and lots of albums and every surface covered with glass and prints below. She was a photographer, but more than, or is a photographer, but more than that was a great archivist. So I think I was born into knowing that photography needs to be looked after, needs to take the form of an album. Um, personally, I hated photography because she always made me pose for her pictures and she had a Zeiss icon and then it would just, uh, take ages to focus. I was at National Institute of Design uh, studying graphics, hoping to become a typographer, uh, very inspired by Satyajit Ray, who was trying to make a type out of his uh, Bengali-English combination. And I happened to go for a concert to photograph the moods of the person. The person happened to be Zakir Hussain. And I just wanted to quickly take pictures, like a lot of my colleagues here today said, we've got one minute, 30 seconds, we're going to do your picture, and that's what they did. And they're gone now, I think, all my colleagues. So I had thought I would do a similar thing. And an organizer just asked me to stop and pushed me. Now, thank God he pushed me. Because I fell, I fell in front of an audience of about a thousand people in the Baroda Palace Hall, in the Darbar Hall. So the organizer pushed me and I fell on my backside in front of this audience of about a thousand people. I was 18, had just got a camera. My sort of, I was deeply, deeply offended that I should fall on my backside in front of a hall full of people. And so I waited outside the auditorium for Zakir Hussain to come out and put my hands on my hips and said, Mr. Hussain, I'm a young student today. Someday I'll be an important photographer and then we'll see. And started to cry. And he gave me water and explained that if you want to photograph, you have to take permission. You can't just get onto stage and say you're going to photograph. 
And besides, Ravi Shankar had added a fret to his sitar. So he didn't want it documented. Fair enough. And then Zakir said, if you want, you can come to my hotel tomorrow morning and photograph me when I'm practicing. You'll get the same faces. And that was really the most important night in my life sitting with my friends at NID trying to decide whether to go to a man's hotel room at six in the morning or not. <laughs> and thank God the organizer pushed me and thank God I went to Zakir's hotel room and I realized in that night this was my ticket to freedom. I could, I could do what I like, I could be who I like, I could go where I like, I could travel with whoever I like. So it was freedom. So it wasn't really some great love for photography. Photography was just the annoyance that delayed every departure in my childhood. But it was this idea that I could you know, really just get onto a bus with 10 musicians and travel for three months. And I thought nothing in life can give me that kind of opportunity. So that's how I got drawn to the idea of being a photographer, not really quite knowing what it means and then photographed Zakir for many years and at the time that I was leaving NID I was able to make a, a, a book about him and I thought that's what photography is. Um, I did my own interviews, I did my own layouts and my own used my own favorite Optima typeface and designed the book and at NID they were okay with me doing that because it was book design, it wasn't photography. So that's how I managed to just push my agenda for photography every time I had the opportunity to make, whether it was a record jacket, anything. And then after I came out of NID, I really, really wanted to be, to be one of the boys, to you know, wear the vest of the photographers and uh, go to all the disasters that they would photograph. And so I went and I met the king of all photographers and said, sir, please give me a chance. I'll make coffee. I'll catalog your negatives. And he just sort of brushed me off and he said, you're a woman and, you know, experience motherhood. What is there for you to do in photography? I was completely devastated and I decided, or rather somebody decided for me that it would be better if I just went away. And that's what I did. I went to New York and traded my dowry with my mother and said, I'm not getting married, but if I do, I don't want a dowry, let me go to New York. So I went to New York and studied photography, came back, became a photojournalist, very romantic idea that my photography was going to change the world. And in two years, rea I realized that, you know, everything that they taught us in photo school really had no meaning and nothing changed except my bank balance. And I became known as India's AIDS photographer. You know, it, 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 was, it, was a, it was a terrible time for me. And then I thought the way, the way forward for me was either to become an activist and really work with the children of the prostitutes, if that's what I cared so much about, or to be a photographer. I couldn't be a photojournalist and try to do both. I felt that was not, not going to work out. So that's the book I made with Zakir. You can't get it now for love or for money because I've, it was pulped on the footpath because nobody would buy it. I think it was first sold for 10 rupees and finally it was all pulped. And I was all these years so embarrassed by it that I never used to even show it. So this is a new thing to make it part of my CV. And then when I was in, studying in New York, it was, I was introduced to the work of Robert Frank among many other photographers and this is a confession but an important one. I'd been brought up like all of us not to steal and all that, no? The, but this was the one time that I did steal because I felt if I didn't have this book, if I didn't have this book of Robert Frank, I couldn't be a photographer. So I went into the bookshop of my own uh, school, ICP, and stole this book on a winter morning in a big black coat and stole it with my friend Michael Richter. So this was about 87. Cut to 97. I stopped doing photojournalism, dying to make family portraits, because I think, OK, if I make family portraits, somebody will put them up on their walls. And somehow, I will have made an archive. 
So that was all I wanted from life because my colleagues were not interested in my joining them. And I thought, let me make photo, uh, fo family photos and if 300 families have them up in their homes, then that's enough. That's uh, enough of a contribution to photography. So I started making family portraits, but it was very difficult to get the money. The families didn't want to pay me. No magazines at that time wanted pictures of well-to-do families. Um, but I wanted to make the pictures. I got a call saying, Robert Frank would like to know how much money you need to complete your project. And I, I thought, you know, the FBI is behind me, that this, <laughs> this theft of mine has been caught and I'm going to be trapped into something. So I just said, oh, $10,000 would be fantastic. So they said, OK. And then I really didn't know what to make of it. Then I thought, it's a pr crank call. But a check arrived for $10,000. And those $10,000 led me to privacy. All my photographs done in 97 and 98 were done with that $10,000. I would sleep in friends' houses. And uh, I could give prints to the families. And of course, my reaction was, oh, what does Robert Frank want from me? And the message back from him was, that if you don't want the money, throw it into the sea. It's for you to continue that project that I was told about. So this was the, ama the second amazing story. The first was this organizer pushing me, and you know, God bless his soul, wherever he is. And then there was this Robert Frank Grant. I mean, today, if somebody gave me $10 million, it wouldn't mean the same thing as that $10,000. And that allowed me to get a certain I don't know if confidence is the right word, but I met Mona, Mona at, on a regular assignment making uh, a book about uh, you at that time as a photojournalist, 89, going back a little bit. To be taken seriously, you had to do a eunuch story. Went to photograph Mona. Mona thought it was for New York Times. Actually, it was for London Times and took my film away. And that formed this incredible friendship, which continues even today. I think she's, you know, with my mother, the most important person in my life and the most consistent person in my life. So I was able to just continue photographing Mona, and we made a book together. And some of you may know the story. I went to uh, Walter Keller in Zurich, and we were making a book about all my work, and he said, he looked at the Mona work and he said, this is amazing. We have to make a book just about Mona. And I said, no, we can't do that because Mona is a hijra and she doesn't like to be uh, published. People always want to write about her castration. She doesn't like that. So he said, no, 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 you, we're going to make the book and you write to her. So I sent her a fax through my mother saying, world's best publisher would like to make a book on your unique self. Do you agree? She sent a fax back saying, Whole world calls me eunuch. You call me unique. First you tell me which is true, then I will answer you. <laughs> so this is the third lucky coincidence because the fax arrives on Walter's table. And he says, this is incredible. She's going to write the book. And then all my prejudices come up. And I say, Walter, you sit in Zurich. You have no idea, A, what it means to be a hijra. Second, what it means to be thrown out from the hijras and then to be living in a graveyard. How do you think she's going to do it? And she did. She dictated letters to Walter Keller, dear Mr. Walter, and she told him her story, full of lies, full of contradictions, as all biography is. And Walter left it all there. So if you read the book, which I highly recommend, it's a beautiful story. It's really, really, it's a, it's a very moving story and great strength in it. Um, she. She told her story as she wanted to. And then after the book came out, when BBC came to make a film about us, uh, she said, this book, all lies. You give me money, I'll tell you my true story. <laughs> and another, my film is, um, I mean, my, my, my life sounds a bit like a Hindi film. But it's just one, one great meeting after the other. Bad ones in between also, and the usual heartbreak and all of that. But some other great meetings. So Gerhard Steidel, this wonderful publisher, 
who, who really enabled me to go the full way with books. I went to meet him when there was a show in Berlin with the family portraits that Robert Frank had given the money for. And he said, do you want to make a catalog or an artist book? And I said, you know, what is the difference? Um, I don't know. And he said, well, if it's an artist book, you have to make every decision, including the paper, the binding thread, the end papers, and of course, the sequence and size and all of that. So I said, well, I'd like to make an artist book. And so he sent the curator away, and we sat together and put privacy, built up the sequence. And really, he has these long tables, which I've simulated in my house in Goa. And it's all done with, with scissors, scotch tape, cutting up the prints. So nothing on the computer. Finally, of course, it goes on to the computer. And finally, the most beautiful printing in the world is done at, at, in the same printing, in the same publishing house. But he, Gerhard says that it's really important that we make books with our hands because finally they're going to be these physical objects. And he thinks a problem with bookmaking is that it's all done on the computer. And the first time you really hold something in your hands is when it comes back from the press. So I've learned a lot from Gerhard and also received tremendous, tremendous support from him, something that has allowed me to continue to make work away from the gallery and away from the museum and to sort of do my own thing because there is this crazy man in Göttingen in Germany who will publish what I say, uh, whatever I bring to him. And so I think very carefully about what I take to him. But as long as I'm pushing myself, as long as I'm challenging the last book, he's happy to go ahead with this. So we made a book, an accordion fold book of, my, which I'm, of photographs that I had put together during my residency at the Gardner Museum. <coughs> and the idea with this book was, again, the museum said, do you want to make an artist book? And I said, really, what's an artist book? They said, well, an artist decides everything. I said, in that case, I'd like to, I'd like to decide that the book is not sold, but it's just disseminated, because that is really the aspect of photography that I love the most, the dissemination. And they said, OK, but how do you plan to distribute it? So I had a distributors list, 50 friends all over the world. Each one got an edition of 10. So if it was Sadanan, then the book would say SM 1 of 10, SM 2 of 10, SM 3 of 10, and he would get 10 books. And he has to decide what to do with them. And so Jonathan in Birmingham said, oh, this is too exclusive. I'm going to give these 10 books to the first 10 people I meet uh, today. So the bus driver, the security guard, the receptionist, the curator who came to see him, the books were distributed. Similarly, all my 50 friends distributed the books. They didn't have to tell me who got the books or nothing. So the books just went out into the world. And then I had the, I had the great honor to meet Saul Levitt um, much, much later in sort of 2005, I think. And so I thought, what do I take Saul Levitt? And you know, you don't take someone like him, a bottle of wine or a bunch of flowers. So I took him one of my edition of the chair's book. And he looked at it and he laughed and he said, you can keep it there, Anita. I have three already. <laughs> so I think what stayed with me from photojournalism really was the dissemination of photography. And that is something that I'm always in a bit of a, I can't say conflict, but there's, it's, a, it's a challenge to be part of the art world and still have be able to use the dissemination part of photography, which is what I enjoy the most. So books have become are really the main thing. Uh, I often say that the exhibition is just a catalog of the works that are in the book, because the book is the work. I made Go Away Closer because I made this picture that is behind me as well. I photographed Poppy, who I've been photographing since she was born, and this was you know, a typical afternoon comes back from school, bad mood, and this auntie from Delhi is there with her camera, and so she was, you know, sort of leave me alone. I took that picture, and it suddenly said, go away closer to me. Those were the words. And then I went back 
to Delhi because I recognized the emotion of that picture. And I went into my archive and I found all these photographs that were actually my rejects. They were what I used to call my sides because they weren't part of whatever I was photographing at that time. And so this is how Go Away Closer, this slim little book got made which title. Uh, just 30 photographs, very, very carefully choreographed in their sequencing. Uh, my kitchen in Delhi and the little black books are what I call my kitchen museum. And this is how I like to travel. I work with a medium format camera and I like to cut my contact sheets myself cut them, cut them, and make these little piles of photographs that I travel with, because who knows what mood comes and what book I want to make where. So I must have all these little prints with me. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't use digital as yet. On the street, somebody said to me, said, heritage, heritage. <laughs> um, so, so, so these boxes and these little prints are very important to me, and also because what started to happen was I, was I would travel with people with some great minds. I've really been very, very lucky in the people that I have had opportunity to travel and engage with. And I never knew how to thank them. I couldn't write a letter saying thank you, it was so um, whatever. So I don't ha I'm not very good in, with my vocabulary, with my spoken vocabulary. So I thought I would make these little books for them. I'd this moleskin book, which is called a Japanese book, accordion fold, and I would paste in these little contact sheets because just from the travel that I had made. So I went to Allahabad with a friend, and then I was photographing in Nehru's house, and I put that work together, not really to make it about Allahabad or Nehru's house, but it was a letter to this friend full of little clues and secrets of things that we had spoken about, not really taking pictures of them. I made a book like that for Atul, for, for his exhibition in Bombay. I hope he still has it. So then I made one for Steidl, because we went to Calcutta together. And when he saw it, he said, this is amazing. We have to publish it. And I said, no, you can't publish it. These are very personal letters. I have made them for one person. And he said, take seven of them. It will be a fantastic box. And I still think it's the, best, it's the best work I've ever done, this little box sent a letter. And then I was in Calcutta. And remember, at heart, I think I started off with photojournalism. So that part never went away, the dissemination part, that cover story of the Illustrated Weekly, which meant about 100,000 100, people would get to see the pictures that you put there or more. I don't know the numbers. But I was used to that. And the art world, the gallery world was just too limiting. So this box gave me great freedom. Went to Calcutta, went to Park Street, passed this jewelry store, empty vitrines, walked inside, introduced myself, um, and said, I'm Dayanita Singh, I'm a photographer. And he said, yes, I know you, I admire your work. What can I do for you? I said, give me your vitrines. So this is January 2008. So I go inside into the vitrines and position my center letter books inside and come out. And I just got a New Year card in January uh, 2013. The books are still there. And the Panwala, who sits just to the side of this photograph, is the sort of unofficial guide who explains the concept of this box, which has seven little books. And you know, for him, I don't think it's the letter part that is so interesting. He prefers to call it uh, Ye Nehru Ji Ka Ghar Hai, or Ye Bambai Ki Tasveere Hai, Isme Gandhi Ji Ka Bhi Ghar Hai. So, so that's his reading of, his, of it. And then there are three beggar sisters. If any one of you have been to Park Street, you'll see them outside Fleury's. They're, uh, Two of them, I think, are crippled. So they also hobble around and then guide people through the work. So I have my own permanent museum on Park Street. And for all the people who worry about museum footfalls, I don't know what can compare with Park Street in Calcutta. I can go to the Ganges View Hotel, and Shashank says, Are, is bari koi kaam nahi lai? I can pull out my box, have an exhibition, and 
you know, when somebody steals one of the books, it's, I just feel it's fine, it's okay. I did it once and if somebody feels they have to have it, it's okay, it's a compliment. And then I sort of insist with my gallery that they put them in the Basel art fair and they say, Dainita, we can't put something that costs 50 euros in an art fair, but it sort of becomes like, uh, you know, you have to, have to. And so, so they listen and then, you know, NGMA Bombay and I said, no, no, I'm going to, the idea that I could put a mass produced book in a museum uh, means a lot to me. So whenever I get a chance, when people say we want to have an exhibition, the first condition is that we must show center letter. And this is how it was shown at the photo museum in Winterthur, in Madrid. And of course, I'm very interested in sort of library of images and making archives. And again, it's, it's at a bit of a, a bit of a, I, I don't want to call it problem, but the art world would like one image. The art world would like three images. Um, I would like to have 100 images, um, maybe 500 images. So books is really essential for me to be able to do all of that. So this is the photograph that uh, David sent me in January 2013. Sent a letter still in the vitrines. That's Calcutta portraits being taken away from an exhibition, taken off the walls and taken home. Peter Nagy, the gallerist, was very happy because he had no shipping charges. So now 108 of these portraits hang in 66 homes in Calcutta. And I had to make them in these big frames because earlier when I would give prints to the families, they would cut up my photographs to fit the frames that they had. So if it was a heart-shaped frame, and some of them, if I gave bigger prints, would put them under the bed because they were too embarrassed. <laughs> so I gave them with these big prints and now they have to put them up. So the photos just kept disappearing from the wall. That was a very, very special week for me. And this one photograph got left behind because she had died and the family had moved to America. At a certain point, I was standing on top of a tower in a Billa factory on a commercial, not a commercial, like a Fortune magazine assignment. And it was from this series. I was very high up with a harness. I have vertigo anyway, so I was not comfortable there. But the scene that I saw was incredible, and I thought, I wish I had some black and white film with me. But I didn't, and the light had gone, and I thought, if I go down, I'll never make it back in time, and I'll never have the courage to come up again. So I took these photographs on color film, thinking I would print in black and white somehow, because I. I wanted the pictures so badly. I'd never seen this kind of scene. Industry was very new to me. And these pictures came back from the lab, and all the contact sheets were blue, because I was using daylight film after sunset. And I thought, this is it. This is, this is the way I can work with color. Up to now, I had never worked with color. And then made Blue Book, which is a book of postcards. And this continued into Dream Villa, where I started to photograph at night. So I can photograph color at night and black and white in day. And then the postcard book was made because Gerhard wouldn't let me make another accordion fold. He w said we can't repeat ourselves. And then came the time to make Dream Villa. And he said, uh, you know, I, I made a very pristine book, sort of one side photograph, one side white which sort of makes it precious, and he said, I don't think so. Then I put them side by side, and then it becomes a diptych. So that's something else. And we went on and on for four days, five days, just making different permutations and combinations. And finally, I got so fed up that I took the photographs and just folded them in half, pasted them together, and said, here, Gerhard Steidl, here's a book even you'll say no to. And he said, this is perfect. We do it. And so Dream Villa is this very tightly bound book with the gutter running through the middle. You can't even leave it open. It has no page numbers. And what this does is, if you, if you want to talk to me about an image or if you want to mention an image to someone, you have to find your own vocabulary for it. There is just, there's no page number. There are no titles, something I had done a while ago but continued here. And 
it just won't stay open. It just keeps closing on itself. It's very tightly bound. So it, it's, it's irritating for people because it's, it's these beautiful, beautiful colors that you get from using daylight film at night. Glossy paper. The actual prints are uh, sea prints. They're so beautiful that you want to lick them. They're really so nice. And then to put the gutter in the m middle was, was a great pleasure for me and great annoyance for everyone. I think, I don't know if we sold any of this book. And then I started to get interested with the idea of projection. And I think this again had to do with my ideas of photography that go back to that time of photojournalism. And the idea that with a projection, I wasn't restricted to one image. That I could again build my own sequences. I could build, I could have 500 images if I wanted. And that it was all ephemeral. That there was no frame, there was no paper that you just had to hold the edit in your head if you could. You would only see one image. Here we did two projections. And then I came to the idea of photo fiction. And that's how House of Love emerged. So but by this time, I had been, I had really started to feel that photography is at a dead end, um, that it's not enough to be making photographs that I could, I could make photographs with my eyes shut. And now, with the kind of technology, all of you could do the same. You don't even have to open your eyes to take a picture. Um, shoot away, shoot away. And so, so what, what does it mean? And I started to feel that really photography has become the, the truly democratic medium now, because now everybody has access to photography. So it's like saying everybody has access to words. So, so you can make some beautiful words. So you can make a sentence perhaps. But so what? Um, maybe you can pull a paragraph together. So big deal. What, 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 what more is going to happen with photography then? Because it's no longer enough just to make photographs. And I started to look to literature that I had got quite immersed in by now. And I thought, until we can find other forms in photography. Maybe, maybe we can think of literature and say, you know, I have all these photographs, or with these photographs, or what am I going to do? Do I want to write a poem, or do I want to write a piece of fiction? Um, do I want to do biography? Do I want to do a, a film script? And that perhaps that would give different directions to how to work with photography. And I thought, I want to make a book of short stories. And I'm very inspired by Calvino. And like all inspiration, I derive a lot from him. And I have, I don't know, stolen is not the word, but I have taken a lot from him, including completely imitating the cover of this book. This is Adam One Afternoon, one particular rendering of it. So I told the designer, same typeface, everything. It has to look like a Calvino book in the literary section. And the, it was designed with the exact size of Austerlitz, another book that's very important to me. So that you would find it, you would think that, oh, this should be in the literature section. I thought, why can't people read photographs? When will people start spending some time with photographs like they do with a piece of fiction or poetry? And so I made House of Love. It's a book of short stories. And the titles, most of them are stolen from Calvino. And Vikram Seth is another great source for me. Um, I use his poetry. I use his titles. I cut up his poems and paste them into my books. And this is Continuous Cities, obviously with the reference to Invisible Cities. So this is all that night color and the sort of hallucinogenic color that I'm quite familiar with now. And this was, this was another project that, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's called Pointe Irony or something like that. Point. Anis B. and Hans Ulrich Olbrist and Christian Boltanski have this project where they invite an artist 
to do something with eight sheets of paper. And they print 200,000 copies of it, and it's disseminated in all these museums. I think some were sent to Chandigarh as well. And so I was invited to do something. And I had just finished working on Dream Villa, and I thought, I'm going to make a reading list for anyone who cares to, who's interested in a reading list. Here it is. So I put my photographs as though they were t uh, the covers for these books that have been the most important for me. The most important photo book, the book of photography that's the most significant for me is uh, Calvino's Difficult Loves. Any of you interested in actually the visual, visual arts, it would be a great book to read. So that's the cover, Difficult Loves. Then Shadow Lines, Amitav Ghosh, Running in the Family. The author's names were not given because I thought someone might go to Google and you put Running in the Family and then you know it's on Dache and then maybe you read the book. It's all a bit far-fetched, but distributing this was fantastic. We had a release for it at the art fair. I think Atul was in the audience there too. And then we gave it in the audience, then we came out and gave it to the security, and then we gave it, it was cold, it was winter, we gave it to the beggars on Lodi Road from the car and just kept distributing this issue wherever we could. It never came back to me in a paper bag, though some of my Zakir pictures have come back to me in paper bags. So I don't know how it got used, whether anybody framed it, but this is A3 size, so it's really, it's very beautifully produced and immensely satisfying for me. A Room of One's Own, Virginia Woolf, essential, essential for every, every person. And I, I too don't like all this women category and all that, but essential. Jeff in Venice, Death in Varanasi. A lot of my editing and sequencing comes from studying Jeff Dyer and Michael Ondaatje. I really can say that I, I don't look to anyone in my discipline. Um, it's, it's really literature and cinema that informs the way the work moves and shifts and changes all the time. The idea of India, of course, I'm very partial to. All You Who Sleep Tonight, Vikram Seth's Book of Poetry and Austerlitz of Seabold, my favorite photography book. And then, you know, there was the retrospective kind of phase arrived, and which was, which was very annoying for me because it, a, a, a chronology is expected in a retrospective, which is, which is not my chronology. Uh, who, who can really say, could Dream Villa have happened without the Mona work? Could Blue Book have happened without the I am as I am work? And so now I wouldn't do something like this, but this was a big book chronologically done with all my works, with, with some pretty impressive writing. But this is where I am now. This is my main book. This is what I wanted to really share with you. This is about six feet tall, and it has in it, on the outer surface, it has 40 images. Um, and inside another hundred images. And then you can open one flap, so to say, of the book, and you get this corner, and you can open the other flap, and you get a wall. And these are all pictures of um, files. Recently, for the last two years, I've been obsessed with rooms full of files. And then you can go to the structure, and you can, I've. It's clear I've just returned from Japan. And you can unscrew the little sticks, and you can change the photographs. So a gallerist's nightmare, 140 images being presented as one work, and that it keeps changing, that there's no one. I'm, I'm terribly tired of the idea of this one image in a frame. And so this is what I've started to do now, to make these boxes and structures that can keep changing all the time, that I don't want a single image to be there. So now at the Kiran Nadar Museum in Delhi, I have a, a wall, I have a room where there are lots of nails, I should have put some pictures of that, I'm sorry. And 
a box of 52 prints. So whenever I feel like, I go and change the images, and most of the nails have nothing on them. There's just nails. And sometimes I might do it with a friend. Sometimes I do it on my own. Um, and that's, that's the part that I really enjoy about photography now, that I've been able to make these ways to get around the very tight structures of the art world that I've been able, and books have allowed me that. And I guess with age, a certain confidence to say 52 images is one work, or 140 images is one work. You know, to, to, to my colleagues in, that don't come from the photo background, it doesn't seem like anything new. But there's terrible limitations put on in the art world when it comes to photography, when you come through photography. So then there are all these strange structures that you have to adhere to. And it's not that I make books in response to that, but books is where I have my freedom, total freedom, projections, and now these structures, which, uh, and I hope in a few months to have an exhibition where there are only these structures. So you just have to walk through this labyrinth of I don't know, it'll probably have more than a thousand images. So that's all that I wanted to talk about. Thank you, Danny. Thank you.